Hello and welcome back to the Writer's Room. I'm so happy to be with you all today. I told you we were focusing on craft this week. It's just one of my favorite things to do to geek out on writing and uh, go to an author that I think is tremendous and lift up the curtain to like, what, what are they doing? What moves are they making here? How are they achieving this spellbinding, page churning, riveting, sort of, oh my gosh, how can writing be this good effect? So we're gonna do that together today. We're gonna to be using uh, one of my favorite authors, Lauren Groff. If you don't know Lauren Groff, uh, President Obama, when he was in office, uh, said her book, Fates and Furies, was his favorite book of the year. So that kind of made her a little more of a household name. Um, but she is, I think, one of our, the best American literary authors around uh, today. And I learn something from any piece of writing, whether it's her novels, her short stories, anything she writes at all, I learned something from. So she's a great teacher, as well as being like a phenomenally entertaining writer in the sense that, you know, I'm not reading just like, because it's technically perfect. Um, I'm engrossed in the story. So what I thought I'd do today is just share with you a little bit of how, how do I use um, another writer's writing to really improve my craft. It's, it's, you know, it's easy to get, Stephen King always said, you have to read everything twice if you're a writer, because the first time you get, the writer did a good job, completely swept away by the story. And that's true in, in, in Lauren's work. And then you read it again as a writer and say, you know, what did they do? So we're going to do kind of the version two together today. And I'm just going to um, read a little bit from the very first story. This is a collection of short stories. She writes a lot of novels. I, I happen to like her short stories the best maybe because that's what my most recent fiction book is short story and I've just been reading a lot of them and I'm just going to read a few pieces of this and then we'll break down what was the move Lauren used and then hopefully you'll hear something in here that inspires you to try her move in something you're writing remember that you know we can read fiction and get a move for nonfiction, and we can read nonfiction and get a move for fiction so for example if someone is writing um, a fictional or I mean a nonfiction book and they use like an extraordinary statistic and you found yourself thinking about it all day long, you could still do that in a fictional book and make up the statistic and have something where it really changes the causality, the cause and effect of your world, right? Um, on the contrary, you could read a piece of fiction where there's an incredible use of subtext and pull that subtext into your nonfiction book. So we can all learn from everything. Um, I think it was Ray Bradbury who said that he thought the making of a great writer came that a writer every day would read a poem, an essay, and a chapter of a novel or a short story. So the idea was like reading all genres constantly will make you the best writer you can be. So this is fiction. This is a collection of short stories, fictional short stories. And um, I'm just gonna, like I said, read a little bit here so that we can um, look at what, what's going on. What's Lauren doing that makes this so exquisite? And you can decide if you think it's exquisite, you may relate to her writing or not, but I want you to find somebody this week to use as your model. All right, so here's Lauren. On my nighttime walks, the neighbor's lives reveal themselves, the lit windows, domestic aquariums. At times, I'm the silent witness to fights that look like slow dancing without music. So she's, she's, this is a character who's walking around the neighborhood at night. It's astonishing how people live, the messes they sustain, the delicious whiffs of cooking that carry to the street, the holiday decorations that slowly seep into daily decor, all January, I watched a Christmas bouquet of roses on one mantle diminish until the flowers were a blighted shrivel and the water green scum, a huge Santa on a stick still beaming merrily out of the ruins. Window after window nears, freezes with its blue fog of television light or its couple hunched over a supper of pizza, holds as I pass, then slides into the forgotten. I mean, that's one paragraph in this, whatever, you know, maybe 10, 15 page story. And right there, we have a masterclass. To me, we have a, we have a, we have a masterclass in literary writing. Let's look at some of the moves Lauren makes just in this one paragraph. And I highly encourage you, if you like Lauren's book, to read Florida or any of her other works because they'll all be instructive as this one. So on my nighttime walks, the neighbor's lives reveal themselves. She's setting up here kind of her thesis for this paragraph, right? I'm going to take you on my nighttime walk and see these lives that are revealed. Then she does comma, the lit windows, domestic aquariums. 
So this is metaphor, right? It'd be a simile if she had said the lit windows, um, you know, look like domestic aquariums or like domestic aquariums, right? Like and as makes it a simile. Just saying the lit windows are domestic aquariums is a metaphor. Now, figure work, which simile metaphor fall into, is an, a phenomenal way to elevate and uplevel your work. You've got to, we've got to do it well though, right? And Lauren does it well here. We we sometimes get tempted to make a similar metaphor into something that would be very expected. You know, the 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 steel concrete bulldozer looked like a dinosaur. Yeah, I mean it, it does look like a dinosaur. We'd already get that walking down the street. But if the the construction equipment looked like ballet dancers, that's going to be very different. Well, why are these industrial machines? Why do they look balletic? What, what's going on there? That would be very interesting. So you wanna give the brain an unexpected comparison in your figure work. And I think Lauren does that here. The lit windows, domestic aquariums. And it also, the similar metaphor needs to tie back to the tone of what's happening. This woman is a voyeur. That's kind of the tone of the story. She's walking through the streets, looking at the, um, the lives of others to kind of avoid her own stuff, to avoid her own pain or to get a break from it, right? So instead of watching TV, she's out on the streets looking into the neighbor's windows. So the domestic aquarium is very apt. She is looking at these as aquariums like we might in a zoo or a fish store or an aquarium. Okay. Then I thought this was incredible. It's astonishing how people live, the messes they sustain, the delicious whiffs of cooking that carry to the street. So she's giving us messes, which is visual, whiffs of cooking, which is um, you know, um, olfactory smell, the holiday decorations that slowly seep into daily decor, seeping. She's already telling us of the rotting, the deterioration by the verb she uses. You know, they're not merrily standing as daily decor. They're not jauntily sentinels of their seeping. So we already see that this is a story about the decay of something, right? But then she does something really great, something I want to start doing more in my writing. She doesn't just leave it at that. She, that's very, very descriptive, right? We, we really kind of get holiday decorations that sleep seep into daily decor. We've all seen the person. I can think of someone on our street who still has their Christmas lights up and suddenly it's just like, oh, I guess that's their lights. So we get it, but then she extends the description. Now you can do this with a similar metaphor or simply a description. So now she gives us, a, a, a she takes it further, okay? So this is, she's, she's building on the image she's just presented of the holiday decor seeping. That's still general. Now she's gonna make it super cinematic and specific. All January, I watched a Christmas bouquet of roses. So we see this bouquet of roses that was there for Christmas on one mantle diminish until the flowers were a blighted shrivel and the water green scum. So again, we get subtext here is that something is rotting, something's festering, something is neglected in this woman's world. This is the lens through which she's another character might see, you know, a beautiful uh, dissolving into rainbows, you know, if something different was going on in their life. So she's, she's employing subtext here and a blighted shrivel and the water green scum. Amazing, right? Unexpected description. But then she gives us one more part, a huge Santa on a stick beaming merrily out of the ruins. This is the one hope maybe. Santa's not giving way to the, to the disintegration of all, right? He's beaming merrily and out of the ruins. Isn't that, I just think that's extraordinary. Using holiday decor as ruins, we think of architectural ruins, right? maybe nature ruins, but holiday decorations, really unexpected. This is what pleases our brains and it also makes it cinematic. We build the picture in our minds. Last point here, window after window nears, freezes with its blue fog of television light. That's to me another, another just stellar moment in this paragraph. The, the blue fog of television light. We're back to this aquarium, back to this eerie voyeuristic world, back to this detached, isolated existence. This whole story feels cut off. People are hunched over pizzas. They're just glazed eyes and from the blue fog of television. So instead of just saying, you know, the flicker of the TV screen, which would be the cliche, She's created something different. So write the cliche, then circle it and go back and say, what's a different way 
I could say the flicker of the television screen on their faces. Oh, the blue fog. And it's especially poignant because it's a callback to the aquarium metaphor. This is one paragraph. How many sentences? One, two, three, four, five. Five sentences, and she's given us a masterclass. Find someone you love. Take one of Lauren's move, add a really unexpected similar metaphor, expand a description into something very specific and give us more. Choose a non-cliched way of describing something and use subtext to enforce and reinforce what you're showing us here. It, writing is so cool. I can't wait to see what you come up with with your inspiration. And let me know if you loved Lawrence or if you find something else that just absolutely lights you up. Have a great writing week.